Well, welcome. And again, we just ask that the Lord would be with us and bless us as we worship him tonight. Let us come with confidence to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How good is the God we adore. God, our Heavenly Father, you who has revealed yourself to us as one who hears and answers prayer, look down in mercy upon us, your children, and let your fatherly blessing be upon us and abide with us. Here may we, your people, bring our earnest prayers to you and bring our offerings of praise and adoration. In Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, you have freely given the gift of salvation, the promise of sins forgiven, and eternal life to all who believe and trust in you. By your grace, we have the promise that in Christ the burden of sin will be taken away and the bond of evil will be broken. In your strength, the fallen will be raised, the weak strengthened, the blind enlightened, and repentant hearts comforted and healed. Now, having come together in this way to worship you, may we hear you speaking to us, and may we be challenged and equipped to serve you in our lives throughout this coming week. For we pray all this in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. One day when heaven was filled with his presence. Thank you. 
with good singing. Praise God. Our Old Testament reading, Psalm 14. We're going to read it responsibly. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good. No, not even one. Will evildoers never learn? Those who devour my people as men eat bread and who do not call on the Lord? There they are, overwhelmed with dread. For God is present in the company of the righteous. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. We come humbly before God in prayer. Most merciful Father, we do come to you this night with humble hearts confessing our unworthiness. We have gone our own way and not your way. We have so often lived our days totally forgetting that you are the one who supplies all our needs. And so we have been ungrateful for all your goodness to us. You have not loved others. We have not loved others. We have not shown your love in action, neglecting to be there for the needy and the vulnerable. We have not shared the gospel with those around us. We have taken on board the standards of the world and rejected the way that you have set out for us in your commandment. But even so, you have not disowned us, wayward children though we be. Day by day, you have stretched out your hands in love. Receive us now as we come to you in total repentance and grant that we may from this day on live upright, honest and useful lives to the glory of your name. God, you, have, you who have given gifts, graces and skills to be used for your honour and for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom, teach us in all our ways to love, to honour and to serve you. Help us to trust you as our friend, to confide in you as our counsellor, to follow you as our guide. Lead us through sunshine and through the dark times as seems best to you, knowing that all you do in our lives is to your honour and glory and for our growth into spiritual maturity. As we advance in the journey of life, may we feel that we are ever drawing nearer to you and in Christ ever give us the assurance that our last step will be a safe and peaceful passage into the arms of your eternal love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In Christ alone my heart is found.
gospel reading comes from John 10, and we will read it responsively. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And then for our epistle reading, we turn to our Bibles, Galatians 3, 1 through 14, on page 1138, 1138, chapter 3, 1 to 14. A reminder that we are justified by faith. Our salvation does not come to us through what we do or who we are, through good works. It is all of God. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the, by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the nations by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things, which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And again, we ask God to richly bless those readings from his word. Well, again, welcome, everyone. I, sorry, don't know his name. What is it? Sammy. Sammy. Welcome, Sammy. Great to have you with us tonight. Great to have, have him, isn't it, Isaiah and Mary, eh? Eh? That's good. 
All right, well, um, announcements you can read for yourself, but what I must announce is that there's a congregational meeting on the 6th of August at 11am at um, Ascot. That is to consider a new budget to see if we are able to have Douglas uh, Wannenberg minister to us for 12 months and uh, the application is going forward to Presbytery again on the 1st of August. Um, let me tell you that Presbytery is doing everything to stop it happening. I do not know why. Nobody knows why. But um, God is good, God is sovereign, and we shall prevail. So um, it's important that you are there at that meeting. It shouldn't be long. By well, then we should have also have the answer from Mitchelton and also from Presbytery. But the budget has to first be approved by the congregation after being approved by the new management tomorrow night. No, we haven't. Birthday, it's Nari's birthday. As I said this morning, she's 55 once again. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Nari. Happy birthday to you. Okay, we continue our series on Proverbs, and we're looking at um, Proverbs 33 to 35 um, this evening. Yes. Oh, yes, sorry, it's Wara, um, who is normally with us here worshipping on Sunday nights, um, had a fight with a bike and the footpath, was it? A hole. A pole. A pole. Yes. Oh dear. The pole shifted in front of her, was that it? Yes. So uh, she's a little bit sore and a swollen face, so let's just pray that everything will work out and that um, the healing will take place and that she'll be back to her beautiful self very quickly. And Hugh is not well tonight, so pray for him also. Anyone else? Oh, Mary, yes, Mary, who's in hospital, a uh, friend of Jane and Paul. Mary worships regularly at Ascot on Sunday morning. All right, we're looking at the theme, the Lord's curse or the Lord's blessing, or as we hear, have in our order of service, how to be blessed and not cursed. The greatest thing in all the world is to know God's blessing. Nothing, nothing can um, compete with that. Nothing can beat enjoying his smile and knowing that God, our Heavenly Father, is our friend and that our God blesses us with his love. To hear at the end of our lives his, come you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world, the greatest thing anyone can possibly look forward to so who does the Lord bless? Upon whom does our Father bestow his favour? Obviously, the first thing that must happen if we are to escape God's judgment, God's curse, is to turn away from all wickedness, from all pride, and from all foolishness. Positively, we are told very plainly three things about who it is that the Lord blesses. He blesses the home of the righteous. He gives grace to the humble and the wise inherit honour. And so this leaves us with three obvious and important questions that we need to ask ourselves this night. How can I be righteous? How can I be humble? How can I be wise? These are the flip side of the questions the writer of Proverbs asked previously, am I wicked? Am I proud? Am I foolish? So our first question, how can I be righteous? Righteousness is a matter of wholeheartedly loving God 
and loving our neighbour as ourselves. You know the great commandment. It is seeking to do the very opposite of the wicked things that uh, we have just been speaking about. If you've ever tried to be righteous, you will know that it is not possible to do so fully. In this world, we are still prone to sin, and we only become fully righteous when we come to be in God's presence eternally. But that is no excuse for us to keep sinning. The Bible also says we are to be holy even as God is holy. And in striving to be holy, we will continually, continually reject evil ways, continually reject sin. Remember how Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses is much better, is much higher than that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, in Jesus' time, the leaders of the church, prided themselves on their fastidiousness in legalistic righteousness. Wow, that's a mouthful, isn't it? What do I mean? That is, they work very, very hard at keeping not just the Ten Commandments, but hundreds of other laws that had been invented by them, which the Jews believed had to be kept if you were going to get to heaven. So the Jewish faith at this stage was all about works, all about obeying these 765, I think, laws. And that was the only way you were going to get to heaven. Now, why it doesn't dawn on them that they are not able to keep those 765 laws and therefore they cannot attain heaven, I just have, I just don't know. It should make them realize that the law is not able to save. It should compel them to turn to Christ but it doesn't, so we need to keep on praying for Jews, but not only just for Jews. There are many, many Aussies, many people throughout the world who believe that just by doing good, by being good, whatever that means and whatever that involves, they have a right to get to heaven. They have a right to say to God on judgment day, look, I've been good, therefore you must let me into your eternal kingdom. Sorry, God will say, I never knew you. Depart from me into eternal judgment. And so this is the glory of the gospel, isn't it? In the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. Jesus Christ is the only truly righteous one. He alone has inherent righteousness. Jesus was born without sin. Jesus was righteous from the very time of conception. He was holy, he was blameless, he was pure. He was set apart from sinners for the very reason that only a perfect man who Jesus was could suffer and die and pay the penalty for our sins. Jesus lived a perfect and holy life and then died bearing in his own body the penalty for your wickedness, for your sin, and for my wickedness and my sin. And so, because of what Jesus has done, when you and I or anyone trusts in Jesus, repenting of his or her sins, and knowing that salvation is a free gift from God, it cannot be earned, then Jesus Christ imputes or gives us his righteousness so that we become righteous. And it is only the righteous who are able to enter into God's heaven. This means that your wickedness, your evil is removed, and in its place there is Christ's righteousness. It's like putting colouring into clear water. 
the clearness is replaced by the colour. Maybe I, that's not good. Maybe it's the other way around. Consider the water coloured and then you put something in it that clears the colour and makes it pure. And that is what Jesus does. He pours himself, as it were, into us and the wickedness and the sin is taken away and we stand before God without sin, pure. By this means, people escape from wickedness and death. This is the only way to true righteousness. There is no other way. It is the only way from getting away from the curse. Paul speaks about that, or we spoke about that in our reading, Galatians 3, 10 to 14, where he explains that there's no way to be forgiven by obeying the law. There's no way that you will be forgiven of your sins by being this supposedly good person or doing good things. Rather, Christ redeemed believers from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for them. You see, Jesus became our curse. He took our curse. He took our punishment. He died for us. The punishment that we should have received, Jesus took upon himself so that we might be forgiven and that he might pour into us his righteousness. The apostle quotes the verse from Deuteronomy which says, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree to prove that Christ was cursed. It is by this means that God redeems his people, Jews and Gentiles alike. If you want to be righteous, then these are the things that have to happen to your life. Firstly, you must acknowledge that you are a sinner. There is no way to be made righteous until you come to that point, like Paul, who said, I am the chief of sinners. You must acknowledge and recognise that you are a sinner. That when Adam and Eve sinned, back there in the Garden of Eden, a historical event, you were right there beside them. You sinned with Adam and Eve. They represented you. And so all are born sinners. You are a sinner in need of forgiveness. As Paul says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then comes the good news and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We are justified. We are made just as if we had never sinned because Christ, who was without sin, died for us who were sinners and has made us righteous. He has redeemed us. He has paid the penalty for our sins. You must acknowledge of your sins. You must repent of your sins. Secondly, you must trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we trust in him? By believing, by having faith. And remember, faith is not something that you can engineer either. Faith and salvation is also a free gift. In answer to the question asked by the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? Paul replied, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Acts 16.31. To believe in Jesus and to trust that he became a curse for us so that we would not be cursed by God. To be made righteous by Christ, not by yourself, or through any other means, or through any other person, is to enjoy the blessings of our dear, gracious Heavenly Father, the blessings of sins forgiven, the blessing of all our past sin and evil being removed. We are made free from guilt. We are able to enjoy peace, and we are able to take hold of that guarantee that those who believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ have eternal life, even right now. Okay. Half. So to be righteous, we must acknowledge we are sinners. We must believe on the Lord Jesus, put our faith and trust in him. Secondly, how can we be humble? 
along with true righteousness comes true humility. Bishop Ryle called humility the surest mark of conversion. The surest mark of conversion. To acknowledge before God and even before one another that I'm a sinner is a true mark of humility. It really is basic, isn't it? When you realize that forgiveness and every other blessing cannot be earned, that you have no part whatsoever in your salvation, except that by God's grace and in the power of the Holy Spirit, you, are, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But all of this, that it comes from Christ himself, that it is a gift, then humility must follow. There's nothing that you can claim. It is not easy to say, yes, I'm a hopeless sinner. Drunkards are often encouraged to confess publicly, I'm an alcoholic and admit that they need the help of a higher power than themselves to overcome their problems. We only wish that in most AA meeting that higher power would be God, but unfortunately it's not. God is not referred to. This is seen as the first step to some sort of a cure. It's not easy to admit that you are in a hopeless state, but it is recognised as a vital step. And so the very first step in any healing process is usually to realize that you are ill. If you are sick but you don't recognize it and you refuse to accept it, well, then there's no way that you're going to get better. If you refuse to acknowledge that you are a sinner, well, then, of course, there's no way that you're going to seek forgiveness. Until we see that we are in sin's grip and have no way of extricating ourselves out of that sin, out of that judgment, there's no hope for us at all. We need to bow down before God and confess our total inability to save ourselves. Humility is not an inferiority complex, as some psychiatrists would tell us. Humility is a matter of honesty. To be humble is to realise your own weakness and sin and also to acknowledge the greatness, the mercy and glory of God. We're told this day that the very foundation of a person is self. We're told to say that there's nothing that we cannot do. And this, of course, is a complete and utter nonsense and a foreign concept. We're told that as long as you put your mind to it, you can do anything. There were, many, there were many assemblies that I attended while working and guiding our schools. Many times the pupils were told, you can do anything as long as you put your mind to it. Now, that might be correct up to a point, but it's not really true. You are able to do what God has designed for you to do what God has prepared for you to do. This, of course, is what encourages pride. Pride. Why are the, religion, why are the religions so popular? Hinduism, Islam, New Age, materialism. Why are they popular? Because they promise what you are able to do about your own salvation, about your happiness. They said that very clearly, that if you do these, this and that and those steps, then you will be saved, you will go to Mecca, whatever, or you will be happy. You see, it's all based on what people, men and women and children can do in order to earn salvation. Pray five times in the direction of Mecca. Be a suicide bomber and paradise will be yours. Work hard, work smart, and accumulate much wealth as you can. And so be rich and happy. The emphasis is on self, and that's what people want to be proud of. But God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble, says James and Peter. Jesus himself said it is the meek who inherit the earth. 
The meek shall inherit the earth and enjoy great peace. The proud are brought down. Better to be a humble worm than a proud angel, wrote one Puritan. Two simple prayers that almost anyone can pray are, Lord, show me myself, and Lord, show me yourself. And if you sincerely pray these two prayers, you will learn how to be humble, and your whole life will be transformed. It is the humble who are not under the curse of God, but who are under his blessing. To know the blessing of receiving salvation, of being adopted into God's everlasting family as his son or daughter, of knowing what it is to have the abundant life, really knowing what life is all about. You know, people are told to discover themselves, find out what life is about. You cannot find out what life is about apart from Christ. To use what God has entrusted to us as wise managers for his glory and the benefit of others, that's what it means to be humble and to acknowledge God. Before, we were self-centred, and now we are Christ-centred, which leads, first and foremost, to loving God with all of our hearts and to loving others as we love ourselves. This is true humility. This is to know not the curse of God, but his blessing. And the third question, how can I be wise? Now, you know, well, by now we should have realised that the whole book of Proverbs is about wisdom. We're concerned here with the wisdom that isn't sophistication, that worldly wisdom, but we're concerned here with the heavenly wisdom. Are you wise enough to see that a holy and perfect God will demand holiness and perfection from the creatures that he has made? Are you also wise enough to see that God himself provides the necessary power to become holy and to become perfect. Having seen that, are you finally wise enough to see that it is through Christ and his humiliating death on the cross that God provides salvation to his people, to all who trust in the Saviour? The message of the cross, of course, is foolishness to unbelievers. People out there, if you talk to them about the cross, unless the Holy Spirit has prepared their hearts, they will laugh at you. How can the cross do anything for my life? But in fact, that is to know the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than man's wisdom. It is on God's power that we must rely, not on man's so-called foolish wisdom. The Jews regarded that true wisdom was in the keeping of all those laws. Work hard enough, strive at it in endless pursuits, and you will be saved. The Gnostics, and that word comes from the um, Greek word meaning knowledge, or those who claim to have all the knowledge, believed that wisdom could only be found in knowledge. In other words, being a Gnostic, one who has all the knowledge, they were the only wise ones, but of course they weren't. They weren't even wise. They were foolish because they trusted in themselves. Search long enough, probe deeply enough, and eventually, they used to tell you, you will find what you're looking for, whether it be salvation or whatever. We still have two types today. We still have those two types today, trying to find wisdom through searching and doing. Others say wisdom is to be found in not believing anything. Enjoy yourself today. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Rid yourself of all worry by not worrying about a single thing. Just do what you like. Go with the flow. But honesty will force you to admit that none of these ways are true wisdom. None of these ways bring joy and happiness and peace and fulfilment. None of these ways make you wise unto salvation. None of these ways can bring peace and joy and guarantee eternal security. Yes, it is God's way that is the true way to wisdom. Christ alone is true wisdom. And that is why the writer of Proverbs urges us to know wisdom and instruction, that is, to know the word of God, that we might truly know Jesus, that we might truly know wisdom, to know his ways, and to walk obediently 
in the commands that he has set before us. The writer of Proverbs reminds us that it is wisdom who shouts in the street. And it is Christ who shouts and calls to us, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Christ is true wisdom. To know Christ is to know God's blessing. He alone can satisfy those deep yearnings and longings in a person's heart. That yearning and longing for forgiveness, for true freedom, for the forgiveness of sins. That yearning and longing is for love. The love is revealed on the cross, Christ dying for your sins. That yearning and loving is for peace, peace in your heart, knowing that your future is in the hands of a sovereign Lord who never fails and that you will never need fear the future and that of course includes death. Christ is true wisdom. Christ places you under the blessing of God. What is his curse or his blessing like? Do you realise what it means to be under God's curse, to be bound by him, shut and hemmed in by his mighty hand? Once he lifts his hand against you, there's no escape. You are shut up in the dark dungeon of death and hell forever. That is the end that awaits the wicked, the proud, the foolish of this world, those who say there is no God, those who say I am God. That it refers to those who continually want to destroy what God has put in place for the best of humanity. God's curse is upon them. He will mock them as they once mocked him. He will hold them up to shame. It is easy to laugh at hell now, but the last laugh will belong to God. Psalm 2 speaks of how the one enthroned in heaven laughed, of how the Lord scoffed at those who oppose Christ. He then deals with them. Yes, it doesn't sound nice, does it? But this is what reality is. This is truth. If only people who are walking in darkness and who are opposing God, who are waving their fists at God, if only they knew what was in store for them. How you will hate yourself then. How ashamed of yourself you will be. But it does not have to be like that. If we humbly come to Christ for righteousness and wisdom, and put our trust in him now, then all will be well. Do not forget how God's blessing is. Essentially, to be blessed means to be contented in God, to be at peace with him, for he alone can give true joy and peace, life and assurance of those blessings. There is nothing better. It is something that affects the believer and all his family. His blessing is to, humble, is to be humbly received through grace. Grace is a wonderful word. It means love freely given. God's grace guarantees his favour and forgiveness. It also means heaven itself at last. That is the last and greatest honour for the true child of God. All this is his, is his inheritance, an inheritance greater than any human inheritance. If someone left you a billion dollars in his will, it could not be and will never be a better gift than having the blessing of God upon you. The day is fast approaching when multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. At that time, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And so, like Moses, I want to plead with you this night. In Deuteronomy, Moses says to the people, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey, the curse if you disobey. Deuteronomy 11. Or as he says later, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, 
death and resurrection and destruction. These are the alternatives I'm setting before you here this night. If you find righteousness, humility and wisdom, then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you. But if your heart turns away and you're not obedient, but you're drawn to wickedness and pride and foolishness, I declare to you this night that you will certainly be destroyed. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Now, by God's grace, choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God and listen to his voice and hold fast to him. Want to know the Lord's blessing? Look to him and he will bless you abundantly. Let us pray. Well, Father, again we come again admitting that there's nothing that we can do that you should give to us our salvation. Salvation is a free gift. It is all, not what we have done, but what Christ has done. And so, Father, help us truly to humble ourselves and to receive that free gift in gratitude and to respond in gratitude by living a life that is humble, that is glorifying to you, a life that is filled with the wisdom of Christ, the love of Christ, the salvation of Christ, the peace and abundance of Christ. Father, rescue us. Rescue any here tonight who are still under the curse of judgment. Open their eyes to see the glorious blessing that await them in Christ. Father, may we too take this good news out to many, that many will be rescued and saved from that curse and rejoice with us in the glorious salvation we have in Christ. Again, I pray for any here tonight who do not know your blessing but who are still under your curse. Bring them to their knees, Father. Help them to repent and to truly acknowledge Jesus, true wisdom, true humility. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come, Christians, join the sing. Hallelujah. Amen. You'll be waited upon for your tithes and free will offering. Toby, please. said, I'm the light of the world. 
Whosoever believes in me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Father, you alone are worthy to receive our thanksgiving and praise, because by your grace and mercy you have brought us into the light of the gospel. And in the power of the Holy Spirit we were born again and given the power to go in faith and righteous fear so that our footsteps were turned into your ways and we were able to walk obediently before you. And even though we are undeserving, yet your wondrous mercy has been there for us, lifting us when we fell, giving strength when we were weak, and bringing us back to the truth of your word when we had strayed into disbelief and sin. Thank you, Father. You are great and holy God who loves your people with an everlasting love. And, Father, help us to remember that everything we have belongs to you, and it is only to, to you that we give back that which you have entrusted to us. And may the gifts that we bring, the offerings, also, um, Lord, our time, our talents, that they will be used for your glory, given to you, so that your kingdom will go in us and beyond us. Here are humble intercessions which we bring before you in the name of your dear Son. Bless the church with the gift of true leadership. May your truth ever be taught and loved, and let her life become a worthy example to the world. Convict the world of the truth of your word, so that true love for you and for our neighbours will be central to all that is said and done. In an age of plenty or even in poverty, may we always be ready to give to those in need and for the extension of your kingdom. We pray especially for those who have lost employment and in many cases have lost hope. May their trust be in you, knowing that you are able to do all things and meet their needs at this time. Help them to believe your promises. Give wisdom to our government leaders that decisions made will take into account the emotional, the social and the spiritual well-being of the people. We commend your favour, our gracious sovereign king and all his people throughout the Commonwealth. Be merciful, bring about repentance in the lives of people that all worship will cease and that there will come about a turning back to worshipping you, the one and only true God. We pray for the sick and the afflicted. Father, we pray this night for Dwarah. We pray for Mary. We pray too for Hugh. We continue to uphold Lynn. We pray for others that we name in our heart that we know are not well and need your healing touch. May this time be for them of being healed spiritually and then physically. We pray for our families, keep them true to your word. May the reading of your word and family prayers be central to all that is done. Guard and keep our young people from all spiritual and physical harm. Father, we think of those who at this terrible time have lost loved ones, and um, we pray, Father, that they would know your peace and that you will lead them safely through this valley of the shadow of death. And again, we remember the family of Linda. And now help us so to live that day by day, always being ready for our home call, all for the return of Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord, unto whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be the glory and the praise, both now and forever. Amen. Forth in your name, O Lord, I go my daily labour to pursue.
able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.